When the Apostle Paul preached the gospel of Jesus Christ in the city of Ephesus in Asia, in present-day Turkey, he was in constant danger. Last week, you may remember that he pointed out that they were in daily danger. But this time, after he preached the gospel, the city itself was in an uproar. Those opposed the gospel were busy to the nth degree at stirring up the people, Acts 19, verses 23 through 41. However, out of all of this great difficulty, persecution, Paul wrote that he intended to remain in Ephesus for some time to come, and here's what he said. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me. And there are many adversaries. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 9. Quite often, our best opportunities come as a result of the difficulties that we undergo. In the work of Paul and Barnabas, when they preach, first preach the gospel to the Gentiles, Acts 13 and 14. If you read through there, you'll see that they were run out of nearly every city. Yet, when they, at the end of that first preaching tour, returned to the church in Antioch of Syria, they were the ones that sent them out. It was to recount before that church, now listen, how God had opened the door of faith under the Gentiles, Acts 14, 27. If I stop here with this lesson, do we see where faithful men of the first century put their emphasis There was a recognition on the apostles' part that the Lord gave him opportunity. To the brethren in Corinth in his second epistle, chapter 2 and verse 12, he said, A door was opened unto me in the Lord. Also, when he asked brethren to pray for him, it was that God may open unto us a door for the word. Colossians 4 and verse 3. When we look at our society, our culture, we see what's going on in it. Some of us who are older can remember when things were radically different many, many years ago. We concentrate a lot of times on all of the bad things. But do we realize that with all of these things that we know are not right and are not good and are not wholesome, that there's a door open unto us? We have yet to live in a world like Paul lived in. And when you look at many of the parables of Jesus, he emphasized, look for the opportunities God has given us. All too often we don't see them because we're looking at the closed doors or what we think are closed. But he gives us many opportunities. And they come many times and it seems so strange that there will be an opportunity there. And I speak, of course, in preaching the word, defending the faith. What Jesus said in the book of Revelation to the church in Philadelphia, Revelation 3.8, I think is quite typical of the opportunities for us. 
Because there the Lord says, behold. Well, behold means look at it. It's there. See it? There's the door. I set before thee an open door. I like the next part. And no man can shut it. Do we look for the open doors? And do we realize that many times they come because of difficulty and problems and even persecution? Whatever talent we have, whether it's one or three or ten or whatever, our Lord expects us to use our talent or talents of opportunity. Do you ever think of opportunity as a talent to use something? To the benefit of the kingdom and of the glory of God. Matthew 25, 14 through 30. But if we're going to walk through the door that the Lord opens, I think we can study from this. Behold, I set before you an open door and see some qualities that all of us need to develop. The first one. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now that can be said of you as an individual child of God. It can be said of you as a female, as a male, as a mother, as a father, a husband, a wife. It can be said of preachers in particular, and I'm thinking of the different works are involved in all of these. It certainly can be said of elders as under shepherds in looking at things, how we look at them. And although this is often used to show that leaders need vision, the kind of vision of which he speaks, we know then that the context does not limit this just to those we call leaders. Every one of us, if we're faithful to God, young or old or whatever, we all need the vision to see the open doors. It is written by the inspired Hebrews writer of Moses in Hebrews eleven twenty seven. 27. He endured. Don't you want that put on your tombstone? He endured. He was steadfast in the faith. He didn't give up. He fought the good fight. Hebrews eleven twenty seven says he endured, but now notice what he said, as seeing him who is invisible. How do you see somebody that you can't see? How do you see what's invisible? Well, it's invisible to the physical eye through the five senses, but it's not invisible to the eye of faith. We see all manner of things nobody else can see because we understand the truth of the Bible. And we see things in the light of the Bible, for faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. That's how we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Maybe that's the solution for us in seeing our opportunities, in seeing the open doors that the Lord has opened. You know, it doesn't do any good if the door's open, but you don't ever see it, and therefore you can't go through it. So we have to see the open door. And that means great dependence upon him as he teaches us in his word. It means seeing life as God sees life, not as people without knowledge of the Bible see it, as worldly people who operate on a level that's totally different from what God's faithful people operate on. When we depend on God, when we seek His will to do it, when we look for strength from Him, we'll begin to see these doors that open. But until we do that, it's almost like we have a mask on over our eyes. We only see as the world sees. And it's a shame when members of the church 
citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Those who say they have the expectation of heaven when they die do not see through the eye of faith the many open doors that are before us. We only see things as the world sees them. Someone has said one reason we miss so many opportunities is that they come disguised as trouble. Maybe we need to look at the trouble in our lives and see the open doors that are there. We always like the bed of roses. But that's not the way things get done. You know, even our greatly patriotic 13 colonies of so many years ago, on a carnal level of forming a nation, realized that they were sunshine patriots. They were really big and bold when nobody was there to hang them because of their beliefs. But when the storm clouds came, they couldn't be found. They were running, hiding. And so it can be with us in the spiritual kingdom of the Lord. It's easy to declare, oh, how love I thy law is my meditation all the day. Oh, how I love Jesus until we have to put our neck on the chopping block. There's much truth, I think, to the one reason we miss so many opportunities because they're disguised as trouble. I think the easiest example to see and the quickest is simply look at, at Paul. He's arrested, treated terribly there in Jerusalem. He has to use his Roman citizenship and his great privilege to be delivered from the Jews. He must be tried in three different situations. And yet each time, look at how he dealt with it. I count myself happy to speak for myself. And he could say then, I not only wish that you were all together as I am except these bonds. Most of the time we'd be trembling. What's going to happen to us? I mean, this is the... This is the most powerful government in the world that has him. He's come out of deliverance from the Jewish council where 40 men had said, we're not going to eat a drink, we kill this man. He's before Felix and he's before Festus and he's before Agrippa. And he stays in jail, so to speak for two years before he ever gets, makes the trip to Rome. Look what a mess that was. I'd say that he could look beyond these troubles and see the open door. When a friend suffers in sickness or death of a loved one, do we see that as an opportunity to do God's will? Proverbs 25, 11 gives us some wisdom. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. All too often we allow open doors to close because we feel there's no mistake made by our silence. We just let somebody else get up and do it. If you really want to know what that's like, get into great controversy among brethren and see who stands with you. As Brother Roy Deaver said when they were fighting the anteism of 70 years ago, 60 years ago, he said we had a lot of people behind us, way behind us. So we need to realize what's said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 7. But there's a time for silence. But then there's a time to speak. Open doors to help needy people. Open doors to encourage the brethren to stay with the truth no matter where everybody else is going or what they're doing. 
But we have to be oriented and trained to see those open doors. That's the first thing then is that we must have a vision to see and where that vision comes from and train ourselves accordingly. The next thing is that we must live by faith to conquer. Well, I've already touched on that, haven't I? But I'm interested in conquering the way the Bible describes that as the faithful person overcomes evil with good and eventually ends in heaven. That, that open door of which Paul wrote to the Christians at Corinth was opened by the Lord. He spoke to Paul in Corinth, and here's what he said. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man will set on thee to harm thee, Acts 18, 9. Well, I will grant you that that's miraculous intervention by God to tell him, uh, go ahead and do it. I've got it all in control. But because God does not reveal specifically on certain matters to different ones of us what he did to Paul here regarding Paul speaking the truth, boldly doing it, doesn't mean that he's not with us. If it says anything, if he was with Paul, he'll be with me if I'm so determined to do his will for a pure heart fervently. And it was this assurance of faith that enabled that great apostle Paul to persevere even under tremendous and severe persecution. If you look at the faith in the lives of the children of Israel in crossing the Red Sea as they ran from the Egyptians. You can see some things that are rather interesting. Written before time for our learning. With the Egyptian army that was just behind them, you can see they were ready to give up. I don't know what they thought when they called to mind, if they did at all, all those plagues that God brought upon them that caused them to be let go in the first place. But here's what Moses said to them when they saw the armies of Pharaoh coming after them. Be not afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Exodus 14:13. The Red Sea was parted by God. And later in that great chapter on the worthies of faith of the Old Testament, Hebrews eleven twenty nine. 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. Now as weak as they were and as fickle as they were, if it was by faith, then they did what Moses told them to do as he was the one directing them on behalf of God. And the Bible says they had faith and they passed through his own dry land. I'm sure it took a great deal of courage to launch out into the Red Sea as it was. I don't think we think about that part sometimes and that water standing up on both sides, and the clouds above them. And you're told to go. It takes the same kind of courage to achieve great things in service to our Lord today as Christians. As you read about Paul, Paul's triumphant cry was, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Now I quote verse 58 a lot of times, but this is the one that precedes it. Verse 58 is, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Well, this is the verse that precedes it. Thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can we still say that? Do we ever in our prayers express thanks to God who gives us the victory? Our victory in Christ is explained by the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 4. He says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So how strong is my faith? Remembering that our faith is dependent upon what the Bible says. I can't just say, well, I believe this and so. No, what you're saying is when you believe such and so, if you say it correctly, is that here's what the Bible says about it. 
We will never use our open doors until, until we have the faith to use them. And we're taught plainly in Romans 1 that we're to live by faith. And it means so much more than just simply saying God exists. Jesus is the Christ. He's our Savior. And the Bible's the Word of God. It means putting into practice and everyday living these things. So to live by faith means believing God. Putting our trust in the will of God and the promises of God. And thus you could say then, as Paul did in Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? It was this kind of faith that enabled the great apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 to say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Can't we say that? Is this just for Paul or another apostle? Or is this the truth of God about every genuinely faithful member of the church? Well, when we read this in our own private study, do we not think, I can too? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. We're taught to draw near to God. He'll draw near to us. I don't know how to do that except through praying like he wants me to pray. Studying like he wants me to study and obey him. Is there another way that you draw near to God so he'll draw near to us? Abraham was called the friend of God. Why? Because when he heard God's commandments, he obeyed them. Paul could walk through the doors the Lord opened for him because the Lord was with him. The thing we need to realize as a spiritual body of Christ and members in particular is that the Lord is with us, Matthew 28, 20. So we need to have a vision and we need to have faith and there must be a sacrificial spirit on our part. There is a cost to going through these doors. We might call it a hazard. And that's true in anything that's really worth doing it. Those good, the, the, the good Samaritan, not those, but anybody that would walk in the, his steps. The good Samaritan risked his life and goods in a robber territory in order to help the man who had been robbed and wouldn't give him the time of day under ordinary circumstances, Luke 10, 30 through 37. Now, I personally think in reading that, we fail to see that about the Samaritan. We see just a man with a kindness of heart who sees another man who's in trouble, bad trouble, and just starts to help him. But that man is where he is because robbers lurked up and down there, and they could very well be just waiting for somebody else. But yet he took the time to do what he did in dangerous territory. Paul hazarded his life for the gospel, Philippians 2.30. We learn from 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28, which is where Paul writes of the perils that constantly were upon him because of his service to God. He would not be turned from it. But then we have the Old Testament. Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, on and on you go, Elijah, Daniel, all those others we consider to be great heroes of the faith and look to their example to strengthen us. And they always demonstrate the spirit of sacrifice. And we must too if we're to see these open doors and enter into them. God gave his son as the ultimate sacrifice for us and thus an example. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 3 verse 16. And Jesus died for us that we might live not unto our, uh, themselves but unto him who died for 
them, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. Yeah, following the Lord, if you're going to be faithful, costs something. Last week we talked about, have you counted the cost? In time, effort, money, hazards, I don't know where we get the idea that we're immune and the exception to that when we read what we read of in the scriptures, especially when you see that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If any man come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Then he said, he that renounceth not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. Well, what does he mean by that? When a person is truly converted to Christ and all the word conversion means, it means that his attitude is anything I am and anything I have is going to be used in service to God and I'm not going to let any of it stand in my way in learning the truth and living it. The open door the Lord gives us requires sacrifice. A Christian, though, one who's of Christ, a member of the church, and all that, that means, is willing to make the sacrifice. Christ died for us. And we die for him. Paul mentions that to the church in Colossae in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3. For ye died, and ye are hid with Christ in God. Are we dead to this world? Separated from the way it works. And even if the cost sometimes seems high, remember what Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans 8 and verse 18. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Later on he would say we're saved by hope. That's part of what we're seeing there. What it means to be saved by hope. We must then, too, to enter the open doors God sets before us, develop the kind of love that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians 13. If we ask the Lord today, as if it had never been asked and answered, what is the great, the first commandment? Wouldn't he give us the same answer today that he gave then? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. Mark 12, 30. Now what's left out? That's that idea Paul talks about in Romans 12 where he talks about that we are to yield our bodies living sacrifices. You won't do that unless you have this kind of love. You'll try to reserve something for yourself, but God will not be served with reservations. What prompts us to love God? John wrote to brethren, in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. God's love motivated him, caused him to send Christ to do what Christ did and be a sacrifice for us. Well, then what does our love for him do? Well, it should cause us then to live for him. That means when he opens a door of opportunity, because we love him, we walk through it. Thus Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. Then again, writing to Christians toward the end of the New Testament in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. Notice how plain this is. This is the love of God. Well, I hear a lot of people talking about the love of God, describing it, defining it, explaining it. It's plain here what it is. This is the love of God. What, John, is the love of God? That we keep his commandments. 
that difficult to understand? Ties into Ecclesiastes 12. What's the whole duty of man? Fear God and keep his commandments. When a person tells me he loves God but will not obey him, I know he doesn't love God. I don't care how nice he smiles and the kind of dress he has or what else he may do that seems friendly and kind. If he doesn't keep the commandments of God, he doesn't love God. If we love God, then we will use the open doors that he provides. We'll look for them. We'll see them. We'll be people of vision. We'll be people of faith. We will be sacrificial in our lives. So that same love will cause us to do it his way, to abide in his will, to study it, learn it, and live accordingly, and not like we think so. Love's to be the motivation for all that we do. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 16, 4, remember just a few chapters before that, he wrote the great treatise on love. He said, let all you do be done in love. Love is going to determine whether or not we do what the Lord tells us, period. Love's going to determine what our state of mind, what our attitude, our mindset is toward other people, toward our brethren. Love will decide whether or not we speak about Christ to the lost, even when we put our own life in jeopardy in some way or the other. 1 Corinthians 13, love suffers long and is kind. Love, and we need to learn this lesson, goes the second mile, Matthew 5. The first mile is what you have to do. It must be done. The second mile is where you put in more than you have to do. When I see people in the churches I have all my life say, well, do I have to do this and do I have to do that? When I hear that every time, I say, where's your love? How little can I do to go to heaven? Remove some people's attendance, and I don't minimize attendance at worship, but remove that from their lives. You can't tell the difference between them and the people in the world. Love will help us have the vision we need to see the doors which open the faith to overcome the obstacles and walk through those doors and the willingness to sacrifice, give up things very important to us to use that open door. Well, as we bring the lesson to an end, and we remind you, behold, I set before you an open door. Maybe we need to look at the events happening all around us and not look at them as doors that are closed, but as opportunities to teach the truth. I know that's the way Jesus did. I know that's the way Paul did. I know that's the way that all godly people did that the Bible records. And they were just as human as we are, with human frailties, human needs. So we need to pray that God may open a door for the word. And we need to pray that we see what's already standing there wide open. We need to do that because it's part of what's involved in being steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We need to be willing to make any sacrifice to do that. Have you ever noticed, and I'll close with this, have you ever noticed how we in the church measure what's good and how much we accomplish, how much God is pleased with us by the lands and buildings that we own. I want you to think about this for a moment. No honest businessman of integrity and wisdom would put the money into land and buildings that the church has for years done and use it so little. But we do. As an expedient, well, I'd like to know how that's advantageous to the cause of Christ. Well, it just may be, I know not. 
that these times and seasons as they move on may come the day come the day may be coming when we won't even be allowed to own property. I was talking to someone yesterday and he was telling me about the town they were in. And so far this nation has tended to follow after the West Coast, in California in particular. They made it next to impossible to buy a church building or to erect one or to buy the land to put it on. You see, we don't think about that. We think what's always been this country, why, well, just the way it is. And you say, oh, I don't think that way. Yes, you do. You get up and you come to the building. Somebody's already opened it for you. Somebody's already cleaned it. Somebody's already got it cool or warm, as the case may be. You get up and you go home, you don't think about it. Somebody locked the doors, we hope. Somebody did this, somebody did that. But we don't realize every one of us have an obligation there. But we concentrate on bricks and mortar. What happened to the building of God? Paul wrote to Timothy saying, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. There's where the concentration was. By the way, Paul said that. I don't know that anything records that the church owned any land or had any building. I used to hear it said as a young preacher, and I know it's so because I experienced it. If you want to really liven a church up, get a building program started. You will. You get people to give. They'll get active. They'll get excited because they're building a building. They can put their hands on it. And if you want to see things get done, just say, well, we need this, we need that, we need everybody involved. And it'll always be basically the same core of people. They're active. Everybody else says, we get done. No wonder we don't see the open doors that we need to see. We're just as worldly as the people around us and trusting in material things and measuring spiritual things by material things. If you're not a child of God today, I'm not inviting you to become a part of a worldly organization. I'm inviting you to obey the gospel, God's power to save, believing in Christ, repenting of your sins being baptized for the remission of sins by the authority of Christ and that you live your life in the way we've discussed this morning that you'll see those doors and walk through them that you'll have that kind of vision that kind of faith that kind of sacrificial giving and the love of God that motivates it all as a child of God if you're more of this world than the kingdom we invite you to Repent of those things. Confess those sins to God. Pray for forgiveness. But I know one thing. This is the time to do it. Not this afternoon. Not tonight. You have right now. And you don't have any other time. Yeah, but I will. No, you have now. Well, what about this afternoon? You have now. So what are you going to do with Jesus? And even in offering this invitation, I swing the door wide open. And Jesus says, will you come while we stand, while we sing?